Let's read God's word together. Joshua chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions, for within three days you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But all the men of valor among you shall pass over, armed before your brothers, and shall help them until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has to you. And they also take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and shall possess it, the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. And they answered Joshua, all that you have commanded us we will do, and wherever you send us we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Let's pray together. Gracious God, our ability to know you rightly depends on your gracious revelation. If you had not made yourself known, we would still be walking in darkness. We ask now that you would grant to us the gift of illumination and understanding through your spirit. Cause our hearts to respond in obedient faith to what we see here today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So how is it that you find the rest that you need? Or to ask more specifically, how do you find the rest that your soul needs? I'm not asking about where do you find a Sunday afternoon nap, which is something that my family knows that I need very much, but where do you find the rest that your soul needs? Rest for our souls is something that we are very aware of our need, but so often it feels elusive in actually finding it, doesn't it? Our world promises us rest in, in different ways, and the commercials that we see show us the good and restful life, don't they? Uh, they, they show us people on vacation, lounging in spas and enjoying the beach without a care in the world. And I've never been on a vacation quite like that. Have you? I mean, maybe to a degree, but not the way it's portrayed on television. And, and, and even if we could achieve that, how often might we come back from those vacations feeling more tired than when we left? At other times, we're told that rest comes through just changing or improving our circumstances. If we can just get into the right school or find the right job or get just enough things done around the house, then our souls will be at rest. Others claim that the promise of rest comes through learning or embracing some specific worldly ideology, some way of doing things. So, so maybe practicing just the right form of self-care or cutting out toxic people or, or taking just the right mindset will bring us the rest that our soul needs. And, and Christians fall into the trap of looking for rest in the wrong places. Sometimes we think that we need to do more for God, to work harder, and to accomplish bigger things. And then, and only then, if we can get those things done, then maybe we will find the rest that our souls are looking for. I think this was the approach that, that Solomon took 
in, in Ecclesiastes, and he described how despite pursuing and achieving all of these things, his soul was never at rest. In chapter 2, Solomon says, So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and striving after the wind, and when there was nothing to be gained under the sun." After achieving every greatness and enjoying every earthly pleasure, Solomon failed to find the rest that his soul desired. As we begin the book of Joshua, this is a people that are in need of rest. After wandering in the desert for 40 years, they've come to the edge of the promised land. And that promised land holds out the the hope of rest that they desperately need. But even more than physical rest, do you see that they need spiritual rest? 400 years of slavery in a foreign land has left them longing for a home of their own, surrounded by pagan worship far from the things of the Lord. They long to be at home in a place where they will dwell with their God and he will be in their midst. They're on the verge of entering the promised land, but how is it that they will take hold of the promise of rest? How would they enter into it? In our passage today, we see that it is the word of God that enables us to enter into the rest of God. It's the word of God that enables us to enter into the rest of God. And this is true for Israel, and it's true for us as well. It's through his written word that God reveals the entrance to his rest. And it's not through any worldly philosophy or any particular achievement. It's through the Lord Jesus who himself is the word of God incarnate and who has offered himself to us as the place where our souls find the rest that they so desperately need. So I want to begin looking at verses 10 through 12. And in these verses, we see that God has promised rest in his word. God has promised rest in his word, and here Joshua commands the people to prepare, to make preparations so that they can enter that rest. Last week, Pastor Ryan showed us that one of the key themes in Joshua is the fulfillment of God's promises. This book, Joshua, describes the way God initially fulfilled his promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And one key element of God's promise was land that would provide safety and security for his people. In short, the land symbolized rest. And his people had longed for that ever since the time that God had made those promises to Abraham. And while there had been elements of rest that they had experienced, they had never experienced it in the way that God had had promised. And much of the book of Deuteronomy is dedicated to instructing the people how they are to live so that they may enter into God's rest. And within these instructions that God gave them throughout Deuteronomy, he said, rest is coming, but to enter into my rest, you must be obedient to my word. In Deuteronomy 12, there's one specific example of God preparing the people to be obedient to his word so that they might enter his rest. And I want to read it for you. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 8 through 11. This is what the Lord says to prepare his people to enter into the land. You shall not do according to all that we are doing here today, everyone doing whatever is right in his own eyes. For you have not as yet come to the rest and the inheritance that the Lord your God is giving you. 
But when you go over the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and when he gives you rest from all your enemies around so that you live in safety, then to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there, there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, and the contributions that you present, and all your finest vow offerings that you vow to the Lord. Specifically, the Lord is forbidding Israel to worship in whatever way they want. Instead, he says, you are to worship in accordance with what I will reveal to you so that you might enter into my rest. So this promise of rest is is reaffirmed and they're longing to come into it. They can, as they come into it, they cannot offer sacrifices and worship however they want. They can't do what's right in their own eyes. It must be according to God's word. God promised rest in his word, and the way that the people will enter into that rest is by walking in obedience. The opening of the book of Joshua sees him appointed by the Lord to replace Moses, and God established him as leader over all the people. And considering how Israel at times had rejected Moses and how they had treated him and spoken to him, I don't think this is any easy assignment, right? I mean, any incoming pastor is going to ask the previous pastor, well, well, how did things go for you? How did the people respond to your leadership? And Moses goes, what should I tell them about how the people of Israel responded to me at times? Should I tell them the truth or the whole truth? But Joshua knew, Joshua was there, and now he is walking in obedience and declaring God's word to this people. He's leading with the strength and courage that God has commanded him. So in verse 10, Joshua commands the officers of the people to prepare all the people to cross the Jordan River and enter the promised land. And he commands the officers specifically to pass through the people and instruct them to prepare provisions or food for their crossing. And that phrase, pass through, is one that's going to be repeated throughout the book. And in the original language, it's the same phrase as the command to to cross over or to pass through in reference to the Jordan River. And the author is doing this because he wants our minds constantly to reflect on the miracle of God's deliverance. God is going to deliver them through the Jordan River, and he will repeat this phrase. And every time we see that phrase pass through, cross over, he wants us to be reminded of God's deliverance. The officers command the people to prepare provisions because they will cross over the Jordan in three days and take possession of the land. Now, Israel was delivered from Egypt, and when they were delivered, they passed through the waters of the Red Sea. And and in a significant way of completion, they will also enter into the promised land by passing through the waters. Not the waters of the Red Sea, but the Jordan River. And these two deliverances through water are bookends, the beginning and the end of their time in the wilderness. And God's deliverance of his people is powerfully displayed to this new generation that's coming into the promised land. In in the scripture that was read for us a few minutes ago, we saw that many were unable to enter into God's rest because of their disobedience. And so it's the younger generation that will come into the promised land. And God is giving them this same symbol of passing through water, displaying his delivering power to the new generation. When Israel fled from Egypt, they were instructed to do so quickly, in haste. Uh, When they ate the Passover, do you remember how God instructed them to eat the meal? They were to do so with their belts on and with their sandals fastened, as if they, they didn't know that they would have time to prepare food to travel, that they would have to do so quickly. And they didn't have time to prepare food for their journey, and God faithfully provided that for them each day in the wilderness. 
But entering the promised land we see here is going to be different. The daily provision of quail and manna has ceased. And they are to prepare the provisions necessary for the work that they are to do. So previously, they had fled before their enemies in haste. And now they are to prepare to conquer in obedience to the Lord. And it is the Lord, it is Yahweh himself who will give him this land to possess. That's another phrase that's repeated throughout our passage. The land that the Lord is giving you to possess. And verse 11 tells us that they are to cross over in three days or on the third day. And I don't want to go too far in in speculating on the significance of these events taking place on the third day. At the same time, I think we should acknowledge that these details are recorded for us for a purpose, that, that the author isn't just saying it happened on the third day and leaving it there without a reason for it. Thoughtful readers of the Old Testament will realize that God often redeems and saves his people on the third day. We see that pattern throughout the Old Testament. And here, on the third day, God's people are delivered through the waters and they come into his rest. God, they come into the rest that God promised them. And in like fashion, we know that it's on the third day that Jesus would conquer the grave and come into the inheritance that God had promised him and secure our inheritance. Even more so, these people are to pass through the waters of the Jordan River and then to go and fight a battle. And after Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River, what does he go out to do? He goes out into the wilderness where he makes war and defeats Satan at the beginning of his ministry. So I think that there are some important things to anticipate that this is communicating to us. God had assured his people that they would enter his rest. And when the Lord first made these promises to Abraham and to his offspring, they hadn't gone through any of the suffering, any of the wandering that they would go through. That was all far in the future. But before they could enter into God's rest, they first had to go through deep seasons, even centuries of suffering and of trials. 400 years of enslavement, and 40 years of wandering, and yet through all of this, do you know that God's promise never failed? Through all of the suffering, through all of the trials, his promise never ceased to be true. And friends, those who are in Christ have an even greater confidence that his promise will never fail. Our inheritance and the rest that we look forward to have been secured by Christ. And this is a greater rest than anything that the world has to offer us. Uh, Don't get me wrong, rest in this life is good, but it's always fleeting. And we always end up needing more of it. And it never compares to the eternal and unending rest that those who are in Christ will inherit. Be encouraged that before we enter into God's rest, we too also go through trials and suffering. And when we go through these, the Lord is with us. And we do not have to lose heart. We don't lose hope. God has promised us rest. And we take confidence now, we even rest now knowing that our eternal inheritance has been secured by Christ And I want you to hold on to that truth when you suffer now, when you go through seasons of trial and wandering and loneliness. The Lord has secured your future. Christ has purchased it on the cross. Second thing that we see in verses 12 through 15 is that God has commanded this rest to be accomplished through unity. God has commanded unity in his word, and this unity is essential for Israel to enter into their inheritance. In verse 12, Joshua turns from giving instructions to the officers, and he speaks directly to the people. 
Specifically, he's speaking to the tribes of Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh. Manasseh was one of Joseph's two sons, and so here Joshua was speaking to two and a half tribes, and this is what he says. Verse 12, remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, the Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan, but all the men of valor among you shall pass over, okay, there's that phrase, pass over, armed before your brothers and shall help them until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has to you. So Joshua is instructing the people to prepare to cross over the Jordan into the promised land. And as he's doing that, he tells these two and a half tribes that they must go over with all of the rest of the people. This is a little, a little issue that the outgoing administration has left for the incoming administration to handle, right? The outgoing administration of Moses had made a promise to these two and a half tribes. And that issue or that concern is left to the incoming administration, right? Moses had guaranteed these two and a half tribes uh, to inherit land that was east of the Jordan, and that's the area that they're in now. These two and a half tribes are in the land that is theirs as an inheritance. And Joshua has to ensure that these two and a half tribes participate in the conquest on the other side of the Jordan. And there's this this real possibility that these two and a half tribes say, you know what, Uh, we made an agreement with the, the, the previous administration that we get this land, and so you guys go and, and take care of that. We're going to stay here. But Joshua calls them to remember the word that Moses had spoken to them. It is God's word that they can enter into his rest. And by appealing to the word Moses spoke, Joshua is establishing himself as Moses' successor. He says, I'm quoting to you Moses' word. You need to listen to me. And he's calling them to submit to the agreement that they previously made. And then he adds just this little bit of extra pressure this little bit of expectation. And he says, you made this agreement with Moses, the servant of the Lord. So as if my word's not enough, and if it's not enough for me to remind you that you made this commitment to Moses, remember that Moses is the servant of Yahweh. So the instruction that Moses gave is recorded in in Numbers and again in in Deuteronomy, and I want to see it briefly in, in Deuteronomy. It picks up following the achievement of a victory over, over a pagan king, and these two and a half tribes, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh, come to Moses with a request. After the battle's been done, they say, we want this land. This land is especially good for, for livestock, and, and we're tribes that keep livestock. We want this land. And this is what Moses says to them. Uh, Deuteronomy 3.18. And I commanded you at that time saying, the Lord your God has given you this land to possess. Moses says, all right. I'm, the Lord's giving it to you to possess. But all your men of valor shall cross over armed before your brothers, the people of Israel. Only your wives and your little ones and your livestock shall remain in the cities that I have given you until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as to you. And they occupy the land that the Lord your God gives them beyond the Jordan. Then each of you may return to his possession, which I have given. All right? So so pay attention to a couple of things here in Moses' agreement with the people. Moses highlights that this land is a gift of God's grace. The Lord is the one who is giving this land to the two and a half tribes. It's not theirs to do with what they will or or how they please, but it is governed by the Lord, and it is a gift of his grace. Notice also that Moses says that all the men of valor, that is, all those who are trained as warriors, need to participate in the conquest of the land on the other side of the Jordan. The men are to go to war while their wives and their children remain in the land. 
And, and there's this emphasis that Moses says and Joshua repeats that all the men of valor are to go, right? So it's not a, a small, just a small select group, right? This isn't the elite. This is all the men of valor, all that have been trained as warriors. And verse 20 says that they are continue to continue in the conquest until the Lord gives rest, And here again is the promise of rest. The ultimate goal of the conquest of the land is that the people would rest in the presence of the Lord, but they have to continue in that work until it is completed. Joshua's instructions are are a summary of what Moses said in Deuteronomy 3. What, What Joshua is doing is he's actually reading and applying the scriptures to the people. Do you see that? He's reminding them of the scriptures, and he's applying it to them in their context. In a sense, Joshua's doing expositional preaching. He's applying the word of God to the people in a new context. He says that they are to continue until the Lord gives rest. And this is the first time that rest is specifically mentioned in Joshua. And, and it's really one of the key themes throughout the book. This rest means that they will be free from threats, that they will enjoy their inheritance, and most importantly, that the presence of God will dwell among them. God had been with them as they traveled throughout the wilderness, and he would continue to be with them and among them when they entered into the promised land. There's, there's two other things that are, that are happening here that, that we want to notice. First is that we see this biblical pattern that work precedes rest. All right? Work precedes rest. The work of conquest, of driving out the Canaanites, comes before their inheritance, and it comes before they enter their rest. And this was a pattern first begun with God in creation, wasn't it? That God labored for six days in creating the world and then rested. And and that labor changed after the fall, that that labor came with toil and with, with suffering effort, but that pattern would continue of work and then rest. In Hebrews, we read that Jesus did the work of offering himself as a sacrifice for sins, and then he sat down at the right hand of his Father. Work precedes rest. Also, we see here that it is necessary for the people to be unified before they enter God's rest. They need to be unified so that they can enter into God's rest together. All of the tribes were to participate in the conquest. And once the conquest was completed, all of them could enter the rest. And and this is a command that the Lord gave to the people in the Old Testament, but it's also the pattern that we see in the early church. Acts chapter 2 describes a church that's walking in unity. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayers. They were selling their possessions and distributing the proceeds to any who had need. And as they were unified, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Joshua's command for these two and a half tribes to leave behind their own inheritance and join with their brothers actually sounds a lot like Paul's words in Philippians 2. Paul says, have this same love, being in full accord and of one mind. There's unity. And then Paul goes on and says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Joshua is calling the two and a half tribes to not only look out for their own interests, their own inheritance, but to the interests of their brothers so that they can enter into God's rest. And and so to our church, we realize that to fulfill the commission that God has given us, 
we have to walk in unity. We have to be obedient to the word that God has commanded. And, and if we think that this call from Moses carries a lot of weight, and, and certainly it does, think about what Jesus said in regards to this topic, all right? Here's what Jesus prayed in his high priestly prayer. He says, I don't ask only for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus prays for those within his church to be united, just as he is united with the Father, and he links, all right, he links that unity to achieving the mission that he gave to the church. He says, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. There's a link between the unity of God's people and achieving the mission that he has given them. And so church, we too must put to death the desires of our flesh that can separate us and prevent us from being united. It's the desires of the flesh that cause division amongst the body and can leave some feeling alienated and on the outside. We must count the needs of those around us as more significant than our own. And unity for the people of Israel and for us is not just the absence of conflict. The absence of conflict is a good thing. We should all rejoice in the absence of conflict. But there is more to unity than just the appearance of peace. It's actually being of one mind and sharing in the ministry together. So my question is, how can you strive to walk in unity with your brothers and sisters? Is there a relationship that you need to examine? Is there ministry available to you that you need to step into? Is there sin that needs to be repented of so that we can walk in unity? Might the Holy Spirit reveal to you ways in which you have prioritized your needs over the needs of others? And after church today, might you need to go to someone and say, I've prioritized my own needs over yours. Will you forgive me for that so that we can walk in greater unity and fellowship together? As we all look forward to the inheritance and to the rest that God has promised those in Christ, we must walk in unity. And I am thankful for the unity that God has given us in our church. But without question, there is work that each of us can do to pursue even greater unity throughout our, our body. The last thing that we need to see in our passage is that God enables obedience to his word. That the things that God commands his people to do, he enables them to do. Verses 16 through 18 show us the response that these two and a half tribes had to Joshua's instruction. Based on previous interactions with Moses, again, maybe there's some uncertainty about how these direct commands will be received. But the tribes respond with enthusiasm. In verse 16, they answer Joshua, and they say, All that you have commanded us, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. They state their intention to follow the Lord's commands that Joshua gave them, and they make three commitments, all right? They say, all that you command, we will do. They say, where you send, we will go. And they say, as we obeyed Moses, we will obey you. And as far as promises of obedience go, can we agree these are pretty good, right? I mean, kids, all right, kids, listen to me for a second. If you are looking to impress your parents, right? If you're looking to show your parents that you are on a good track, try this the next time they give you some instructions. They, they say to you, son, go clean your room. And, and you say, where you send me, I'll go. 
right? Or, or your mom says to you, kids, stop fighting. And they say, what you command, mom, we will do. Or, or just say this to your parents, kids, and then actually do it and, and see what kind of reaction you get. I guarantee it, it'll be a good one, and they will be impressed that you listened as carefully as you did to Pastor Westcott's sermon. But along with the, the promise of obedience, they also declare that they will submit themselves to the penalty under the law if they are disobedient. So they commit to obedience, but they say, and we will place ourselves under the penalties of the law if we disobey. In verse 18, they say, whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you command shall be put to death. That's a, that's a strong statement. It's a fearful one. Just as God had promised rest in Deuteronomy, he also promised judgment upon those who disregard holiness and those who fail to keep his covenant. God is a God of great mercy and, and, gr and unending loving kindness, but he is also a God of justice and judgment. And here the people acknowledge that sin is serious. It's not a trivial matter. Life and death depend on their obedience in crossing over and taking the land, and spiritual life and death are also at stake. So in pledging their obedience to Joshua, they willingly submit to the penalties God described in his law. And it's interesting how, how Moses is the reference point both for the commands and the promises. Uh, Joshua referred to Moses giving the instructions, and the people point to Moses as an example of their eager obedience. And the people not only promise their obedience to Joshua, but they speak God's word back to him, and they offer him a blessing as their new leader. So in this there's a sense in which this entire conversation serves as the people's coronation of Joshua, or they're acknowledging him as God's appointed leader. They say to Joshua in verse 17, only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Do you see that they're transferring their allegiance, their, their recognizing of God's appointed leader from Moses to Joshua? These words that they speak are an echo of what God said to Joshua earlier in chapter 1. He promised to be with Joshua just as he was with Moses and that he would never leave him or forsake him. So how encouraging it must have been for their newly established leader to hear his congregation speaking God's very words back to him, saying that God is with you wherever you lead us. And they conclude their, their words to Joshua with this exhortation, right? They conclude by, by exhorting Joshua, saying, only be strong and courageous. And again, this is the same instruction that God gave to Joshua earlier. Now it's being repeated by the people that he's leading. They say, you be strong and courageous as you lead us. And this strength and courage is in obedience to what God has commanded. He is to lead Israel without fear or, and without wavering. He is to do all that the Lord commanded in his word. And I think what's especially remarkable about this pledge from the two and a half tribes is that for the most part, they kept it. They kept it. So often in Israel's history, the pledges of obedience are hastily made and short-lived. But in this instance, they actually follow through as far as the conquest goes. And we'll see all of this in greater detail when we get there. But for just a minute, hear what Joshua says to them in chapter 22 after the conquest is over. He says this, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and you have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. You've not forsaken your brothers these many days down to this day and have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest 
to your brothers as he promised them. Therefore, turn and go to your tents in the land where your possession lies. So they largely keep the word. And this obedience is an outlier in the Old Testament. And while we can look at it and be thankful for it, we know that ultimately this obedience too is short-lived. But it's a reminder that we are dependent on God for the ability to obey what he's commanded. Which one of us would ever dare to say, I have the ability to keep God's commands? The things that God has commanded, I have the ability to do those. Left to our own, we will fail to keep God's commands. Without his enabling power, we will waver and falter. And instead of being a light to the world, we will become more and more like the world that's around us. And that's why the promise that God has made in the new covenant is far superior to the one that he gave through Moses. Friends, we are not left to try to fulfill God's commands in our own strength, but we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, writing his law on our hearts. And this Holy Spirit causes us to walk in his ways when it is beyond our own ability. We have an even greater help than they had with the reminders of Moses. So it is the word of God that is applied and enabled by the Spirit that enables us to enter the rest that Jesus has secured for us. The rest that we long for isn't found in entertainment or vacation or self-care. It's found in Christ. And it's available to us regardless of our circumstances. In Matthew 11, Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will what? Give you rest. So if you find yourself longing for rest, weary of striving, worn out from wandering, then hear this word and come to Jesus in faith. And all who do are assured that he will bring the rest that their souls need and desire. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for the promise and the offer of rest. It is an offer of rest, an invitation that any may come to you and that all who come to you in faith will receive rest for their weary souls. Lord, I lift up to you those here today who do not have that rest for their soul. Would they see you with the eyes of faith and come to you forsaking all others? And for those here who are struggling, who are weary, who are worried, I pray that you would remind them of the rest that you have offered and that you have secured through your death and resurrection. That rest is our inheritance. Would you strengthen us while we wait to take full possession of it? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.